Welcome back Gadgeteers. Today we have another unboxing. As you know by the title of this video, I have here a Lenovo ThinkPad P1, which I believe came out about six months ago. My plan for this system is to get it all set up. So first we'll do the unboxing and then I do want to install Fedora Linux on it, version 29. So we're going to do that also and we'll do some benchmarks in both Linux and Windows and see how it's doing. So I have a Lenovo Yoga 920 which is a very good system and I like it a lot. But the plan is to use this system when I go into the hospital as more of a workstation to get a little bit better uh, video editing and have more power for rendering so we'll go over the specs while we open it up and have a look now first thing to mention personally I would not ship a laptop like this so this laptop was shipped in the actual ThinkPad box and you can see the box is really thin so there's very little protection especially on the top a lot of these laptops have no pad well the box has no padding on the top so it can be problematic when it's shipped this system was a used system not brand new so there is supposed to be one scuff on the front corner left corner of the screen which i could see in the photos i don't really like the ebay photos i feel like you never really can be sure of what's going on because they're so poor quality and if you ever are buying something on eBay and you think it looks fine in the photos, but you're not absolutely sure, it's always best to send a message to the seller and ask them. So let's hope there wasn't any damage of this unit in shipping. That's pretty much my primary concern at this point. I know some of the older ThinkPads can have very fragile screens, so they're not very hard and they crack very, very easily. Okay, so in this box we've got two layers of padding and some padding on the top, which is good. I like to see that. One thing about ThinkPads, you know, when you compare it to the experience of opening a box for, say, a MacBook or a MacBook Pro, the unboxing experience is definitely utilitarian, but that's okay because the point is what you get in the system, not what you get with the box. All right, we've got some paperwork here. And you can see the padding actually is better than I had hoped. There's at least an inch here and then there's several inches on the corners. So I'm feeling pretty confident. All right, we'll pull off the styrofoam. Sorry for all the noise you're hearing. And we'll take it out of the plastic. And we'll look at the outside first. I see absolutely no blemishes on the outside, on the edge, on the bottom. Everything looks really nice. All right, let's open it up. Looks like, yeah, it turns on when you open it up. The previous owner of this system went ahead and reset the operating system so it's just like doing a new installation of Windows 10 except I'm doing the last few steps. This system here is a 2.7 GHz Intel Xeon E2176M 6-core hexa-core processor with 12 threads, 16 GB of DDR4 ECC RAM, it has a one terabyte PCIe M.2 SSD. This can be upgraded to 64 gigabytes of RAM, I believe, possibly 128. I'll have to look into that. And two, two terabyte PCIe NVMe 
M.2 SSDs, which is very impressive. So you can have a total of four terabytes of storage built in. It's one good thing about the ThinkPads, they are highly upgradable. It also includes the NVIDIA Quadro P2000 graphics card. Not really a big deal for me because I won't really be gaming on this, but there are a couple games I like to play, so that'll be nice. The Quadro P2000 has four gigabytes of discrete memory. One of the features I really like about this system is it has an SD card reader, so I'll be able to put in my MMC cards from both of my cameras. It is Thunderbolt 3. It has a USB 3.0 port. It actually has two here, USB 3.0 type A. On the other side, it does have a dedicated power supply connector, two USB-C Thunderbolt ports, a full HDMI, which I think is fantastic. I, I hate having to find a dongle or a USB-C converter. Although if I did want to run more monitors, I could use a USB-C to HDMI cable, which is what I use with the Yoga 920 right now. And we have a mini gigabit ethernet port here. There is an included dongle that comes with this. And then we also have a headphone microphone combination jack. This system is 3.75 pounds. That's a little bit more than my 3.06 pound Yoga 920, but well within specs of what I would expect for a system of this caliber. One of the things I'll probably do early on is upgrade the RAM. So I'm gonna get the operating system set up and then we'll come back. Well, we came up with a run DLL error. There was a problem starting C program files, x86, ThinkPad utilities, PWM TR64 v.dll. The specified module could not be found. I'm going to take a guess and say that the PWM is some kind of power management. It doesn't matter. There's really only one thing I want to do in here. I'm going to go into disk management and we're going to and we're going to shrink the Windows C drive. Now I noticed here we've got a one gigabyte Windows recovery partition. Typically, I just go ahead and delete this because I don't care at all about how Windows restores or any of that stuff. Um, so it's only one gigabyte, so I'm just going to leave it be, but I'm going to go back over here and I want to shrink this volume. I could do this in Linux, but it's much easier to do in Windows. So right now, it says I could shrink it by about 860 gigabytes. So total size before shrink 975. Let's try 700,000. So <clears throat> total size after shrinking megabytes 275,485 megabytes or about 275 gigabytes. So that would leave me enough room for a game, but I think I'm going to up this a little bit to 730, leave about 256 gigabytes remaining. So that'll give me 730 gigabytes for my primary Linux partition. <laughs> There's not enough space on the disks to complete this operation. Curious? Well, we'll try that again. Shrink volume. One thing we could do, so it's letting me know I could shrink it by 860 gigabytes, essentially. I'm gonna do cancel. I have a thought. Uh, let's go ahead and go into Explorer and the C drive and we'll go to properties tools and we'll do optimize and optimize if this doesn't do it I'm probably going to consider blowing away windows it should be able to do it 
considering that it essentially is a reset of Windows. We're going to click Properties, Shrink Volume, and we'll change this again to 730,000 and shrink. Okay, that worked. So we just needed to optimize the drive and trim it. And once we did that and all the garbage collection was cleaned out of the SSD, we're good to go. All right, so we've got 712.89 gigabytes that's allocated for Fedora. So what I need to do now, I'll just leave this open. I have some USB drives, so I need to go through them and find the correct Fedora USB drive. All right, I didn't have very good luck with the USB 2.0 thumb drive I was using, so I have now put in a USB 3.0 brand new image of Fedora 29. So we're going to go ahead and try and get that going and see what happens. So we do F12 to boot up from a different media. And here on the boot menu, I'm going to choose USB HDD. Let's hope this one boots up. If not, we're going to need to go into the BIOS and make some changes. More than likely, we'll have to turn off Secure Boot. We'll see what happens. USB 3.0 is much faster. I'm, in, I'm liking this. Okay, well, obviously I'm in the BIOS. So as you can imagine, the Fedora installation did not go through. So here in Secure Boot, I have disabled it. And I'm hoping that will allow us to get the Fedora installation going. I like to make only one change at a time. So we'll exit saving changes. I'm supposed to be able to hit F12 to get a boot menu. We're going to try that. Yep, it's entering the boot menu. There's a little message up on the top there. And I'm going to go to the USB HDD. And we're going to try again. All right, Gadgeteers, I had to spend about an hour doing some troubleshooting. Luckily, there was a great resource at unixsysadmin.com, and I will provide that link in the description. It really helped me at least get started with the installation. So we're going to go ahead and do the installation. All right, now many of you may not have seen the standard Fedora installation, so I'm going to go ahead and step through. So we're just going to go ahead and do an install to hard drive. And I'm going to select English and continue. And then we're going to click install destination. And it knows that there's about 700 gigabytes free, so we'll go ahead and use the Samsung installation, which is the NVMe SSD. And finally, down here at the bottom, I realize it's really tiny, begin installation. Once the install completes, I'm going to go ahead and step through my recommended installs on Fedora. There's going to be a couple of different ones, though, because we do have to do some installs for the NVIDIA Discrete Graphics chipset that is on this particular laptop. All right, so we have officially installed Fedora, and I've rebooted. I'm going to go through this little setup here. I'm going to go ahead and connect to Wi-Fi, and then I'm going to click Next. I'm going to turn off location services. I'm going to leave automatic problem reporting on and I will click next. I'm not going to install any of my accounts at this point, so I'll just click next and I'm going to create my typical user. 
just mark and my password and I'm gonna start using Fedora because it's already right well not quite it's actually quite a bit we still need to do so I'm gonna cruise over to activities and go into the terminal right away now again I know many do not like the terminal and I completely understand and I'm not ramming it down your throat to me this is the easiest way to do an update so I'm going to go ahead and do the update here in the terminal by simply putting in sudo dnf update space dash y. All right, once the password's entered, we'll press enter and the update will begin. We really don't want to mess around with installing packages or any of that until the update is completed and we've rebooted. Alright Gadgeteers, so let's wrap up the ThinkPad P1 here. Now, forgive any strange noises like revving cars you might hear, jets going by since I'm near an airport, and any other odd things like chainsaws. My neighbors are pretty active when it comes to summertime, so you're probably going to hear a lot more than you would like to hear. Now I do have a Rode microphone with a dead cat on it, so hopefully that will cut down on any extraneous noise. But Let's get right to it. So we're talking about the ThinkPad P1 and I've written up some notes here on things that I like about it and I don't like. So I'm going to start with the likes and then we'll go to the don't likes or dislikes. Um, likes. Great portable workstation. 2.75 pounds. It's a quarter of a pound lighter than the MacBook 15 inch. And I realize it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it actually does come out to be quite a bit. So when you lift this up, you're carrying it, it feels light in the hand. And for me, and right now I'm having problems carrying heavy weights. So I've taken this computer with me already uh, when I was in the hospital and it was an awesome portable workstation. And that's what it's supposed to be and it works great. Uh, the keyboard is fantastic. I would have to say it's the best keyboard I have on my current portable computers and even in the past. Um, basically the base of the computer here doesn't bow very much and key press is crisp and precise. I really really like it. So if you're one of those people who's concerned about keyboards of course you should try it out before you buy it but I think you'll find that it's really nice trackpad um, as far as Linux goes this is the best trackpad I've had I found that it's very very precise so there's no um, how shall I describe it if you've used the trackpads on Max, you know what I'm talking about. They're so precise and perfect. This one, I would say, is equal to uh, the MacBook. I mean, as an experience with a Windows computer running Linux, it's beautiful. It actually is slightly less so in Windows, but it may be because I'm used to it in Linux. But for me, it's wonderful. Dog hair in my mouth. Uh, something you don't get on a MacBook Pro. We've got all these different ports. We've got two USB-A's here. We have a card reader. We've got a full HDMI, two USB-C, proprietary power port, or you can power it from a USB-C port, although the charge will be much, much slower. Um, we have a dongle here for an RJ45 jack for internet and of course headphones. This computer just has what I would consider the pro 
computer, the pro ports that a professional is going to need and use. So it's really excellent. A uh, little surprise, it has the Xeon 6 core processor in it and it is nice when I'm rendering video. Now, of course, in Linux, at least for me, I'm not using any of the cores or any of the discrete graphical video to do any processing. So even though it has the NVIDIA P2000, what I'm really using is only the processor and six cores, 12 threads makes a huge difference in processing time compared to even my four core that I had on the Yoga 920. The other thing is it has much more cooling potential. So the Yoga 920 was much thinner and had less cooling potential than this portable workstation does. Uh, this 4K screen is beautiful, 400 nits brightness. It, it actually, I don't even have it at full brightness right now and I don't need it to be and I'm sitting outdoors. Um, I actually have it at less than half. Well, I'm sorry, let me correct that. I've got it at about two-thirds, so I could go much brighter, but do not need to. You will find that when you're using it, at least in Linux, I have it down to about one-third brightness when I'm indoors. Outdoors, maybe two-thirds brightness. The chassis is upgradable. You can put in any standard NVMe M.2 drives that you want to put in there. So mine came with a one terabyte drive. I added a Samsung 970 one terabyte drive. So I've got two terabytes of storage on this. My unit came with 16 gigabytes of memory. It has two memory slots. You've seen that in the video. I added another 16 gigs, give me 32 gigabytes. So highly upgradable. Uh, by the way, on the weight, I said 2.75 pounds. It's actually 3.76. So it is the uh, MacBook Pro is four pounds, a little over four. This one is 3.76, not 2.76. Has 135 watt power brick. I didn't bring it out with me, but it's about that big. It's a square and about that thick. So a little more than deck of cards thick. Um, not really that heavy, easy to manage, and does seem to charge the system very, very fast. So it has some quick charge feature in there. I'm not sure what it is. Okay, those are the likes. Now let's talk about the dislikes. Um, I was hoping that I would get better sounding speakers. They claim that these are Dolby Atmos speakers and fine, whatever. <clears throat> you know, Dolby is what it is, but for some reason, I've never had anything have the range of highs and lows that the newer MacBook Pros and MacBooks have. My 12 inch MacBook, although I think it only has one speaker, sounds so much better. It really does. So I'm disappointed for the price point on this system. Uh, the Intel Xeon E. 2176M, 6 core, very hot under normal loads. So if you have it plugged into AC, it kicks that processor into full speed and it generates quite a bit of heat. The vents are on the bottom, so you're gonna have to be careful because there's an intake vent there on the bottom and you're gonna make sure that you don't cover that with uh, any cloth, say a blanket or anything. So what I usually do when I'm working in my easy chair is put a board across the arms so that it doesn't overheat. The fan can be pretty loud. Remember, you're not getting this for its thinness or quietness. You're getting it because it's a portable workstation that you're going to do much more aggressive processor intensive work on. So as a result, you have to put up with the fan. And sometimes it's loud enough where when I'm editing a video, I just need headphones in because I need to hear exactly what's going on. Oh, uh, what else? So this one's a top, well, I'm sorry, we're not quite there yet. Uh, the matte black chassis, although I really like it, and I know it's a Think ThinkPad standard to have that black chassis look, which I like. It gets fingerprints on it so easy and grease and oils. It cleans just as easy, but to me it looks not so good. 
now I just kind of live with it and I clean it as needed but it seems to me aluminum chassis just get much less of the uh, stains oils fingerprints on it so consider that when you buy it now this is the tough one and we're talking more about Linux so there's a built-in discrete NVIDIA P2000 4 gigabyte graphics processor there also is the onboard Intel graphics processor that's built into the CPU and as you probably suspected the built-in Intel graphics processor is much much lower as far as power consumption so um, in Linux you, you really kind of are hit with a choice of one or the other so I haven't really encountered any Linux software well I should say distros that let you do both at the same time like you can in Windows so in Windows of course you use the onboard Intel graphics processor and then when you play a game or kick into something that needs uh, much more intensive graphics you go to the NVIDIA GPU and of course it runs much better. So what did I do with Linux? Well initially I used the onboard NVIDIA and I set up the NVIDIA proprietary drivers. A little bit annoying and cumbersome to set up. Allegedly I was supposed to not have to recompile um, the NVIDIA drivers after every kernel update but I have had to despite following several guides and that gets really irritating because you're limited to command line only you have to go into single user mode to do what you need to do to get that uh, GPU driver to work on the other hand the Intel built-in you just go ahead and install the operating system and it will use its built-in Nouveau driver. What is the downside? You can forget about playing games at all on the Nouveau built-in Intel chip. It's just ridiculous. I think I, I went into Witcher 2 and I got like 11 or 12 frames a second at 1080p where with the NVIDIA driver I was actually running in 4k mode and I was able to get 25 or 30 frames a second so it's a lot better when you're using the NVIDIA chip but again you have a choice of one or the other with the NVIDIA chip you're looking at 90 minutes maybe two hours of battery time so it's a little bit problematic I expected way better but don't when you're using the built-in Intel chip I was getting about four hours right now at two-thirds brightness it's telling me three hours 50 minutes and we're at 93 percent it was a it was at a hundred percent when I brought it out here well what's my thoughts on that this is a portable workstation it's not a laptop you're going to be taking with you um, where you need 10 or 12 hours of power on it it's just not yes I'm running TLP for those of you who use Linux which assist in uh, extending the battery life and I'm sure if I dimmed it down considerably I would probably get a little bit more out of it but my testing in Linux I have not tested it properly in Windows we're looking at about four hours you might be able to eke out five hours that is Fedora 29 Linux so another version of Linux you might get even better here comes the chainsaw the other thing about the Nvidia proprietary drivers when you close the lid of course it should go into power save unfortunately um, that's kind of hit or miss yes you can get it to do that there's a a uh, couple of command lines you have to put in to get it to do that the problem is is it often changes when you do an update so you go to put the lid down again and it will not go into power save the other thing is when you put the lid down and it doesn't go into power save and you're like ah oh, darn and you put the lid up sometimes it's frozen and you can't get the GUI back and you can't get even a command line with control alt f2 f3 and so on you just kind of screwed so you end up having to power off the unit and power it back on the thing is you say to yourself 
I did anyway. Well, maybe I shouldn't close the lid. If I don't close the lid, I won't have that problem. And then you do close the lid. And then you do have that problem. With the Nouveau driver, um, it will go into power save mode. And when you open it, it will come right back. When you're doing things like video editing, browsing the web, watching videos, it seems to work just fine. When you're watching 4K videos on YouTube and you pull out the power plug and it runs from the battery, it actually slows the battery down, the battery slows the processor down sufficiently where you can see some jitter, a little bit of drag, some missed frames when you're watching 4K video. So keep that in mind. Probably could dis disable TLP and it would take care. Now, let's do a really quick comparison. I went through and took a MacBook Pro 2019 and spec'd it out with equivalent specs that this system has minus the one additional one terabyte drive because I originally bought this with only the single one terabyte drive in it. Now, the MacBook Pro 15 inch came in at $3,399. So $3,400 for a 15 inch MacBook Pro with 32 gigabytes of RAM, which is actually slower in the MacBook Pro, with one terabyte SSD non upgradable, um, and of course the Retina screen and so on and so forth. So $3,400. The ThinkPad P1 15 inch spec'd out equally actually comes in at $2,984, which that's a pretty nice chunk of change. Not a ton, but $400. So is it worth it? It's an excellent workstation, but I probably would not have paid that for a brand new uh, portable level workstation. Um, I immediately, when I heard about this computer coming out, I was pretty excited about it. I went ahead and looked around for a used one, and I found one for $1,800 with only 16 gigabytes in it. So um, I was a little nervous because the person selling it on eBay only had maybe 10 sales on eBay. But uh, one thing I like about that is many times you can talk to somebody personally, so I was able to talk to him personally, and there wasn't one scratch on this computer. Not one thing wrong with it, not one scratch. Perfect condition, perfect operation. I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to take a chance and go ahead and get it, and I'm really glad I did because now I've taken a $3,000 computer and got it for $1,800 and saved myself a ton of money. So that's my caveat. I would have held on to my Yoga 920 with four cores and just lived with the processing time, which was much, much longer than this one when I'm uh, rendering video. Am I happy with this one? Yes, I sold the Yoga 920. This one is light enough and the battery lasts long enough and it's much, much faster on editing and other factors that makes it worthwhile for me. And of course, I bought it used, so I saved a lot of money. That's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, like and subscribe. If you really enjoyed it, there's other ways to help out. Watch the end of the video. You'll see what I mean. And I'll see you next time on Fast Gadgets. This video was made possible with support from viewers like you. If you find this video useful, consider becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com forward slash fast gadgets.